Hello, welcome to the Cube Pod episode 61. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante here on a busy Friday, historic Friday. Dave, great to see you. Um, hey, John. What's your t shirt Trump say? Is, it says Northeastern University. Kyler graduated from there, plugged to Northeastern. My alma mater, I got a CS degree there. Um, Somebody Kyler else I know too. graduated from there. And my wife's <laughs> Deb. <so>. <laughs> Deb, <laughs> shout out to you. Same year. Great, Dave. Dave, Trump is no longer the Teflon Don. He's the con felon. Convicted well, we'll felon see. Don. We'll see. He's the, we'll see. He's the felon Don. Donald Trump convicted on, um, on well, 65 charges, 35 charges, a lot of charges, a boatload know. of charges. I honestly don't really care. The whole, the whole, the whole truckload. So that dominated yesterday. Actually, I watched, I had to stop working because I wanted to watch it on TV. Really? Yeah, it was a pretty, it was a, it was a spectacle. I mean, it's a pretty historic. I, I, I had well, you paid former, attention before it, before this? I knew it was the Stormy Daniel thing. I knew it was kind of like trumped up on him and this is all a game, but you know, ultimately the law is the law and he got convicted. We'll see how it all plays out, but he's a former president and he's running for president. It's the first time a president candidate in the United States is ever running a convicted felon. So I personally think it's unhelp his base more. You know, I, you don't know what's going to happen. The more, press you give him the more he gains so um very polarizing effect obviously but i, I again it, to me it's all theater i, I just uh, I, I don't really want to talk about it i like to see better candidates on both sides to be honest with you i'm like i'm kind of yeah everyone's kind of frustrated totally agree but dude big big time action look at let's look we're just kind of taking a deep breath from the cube roadshow a lot of action oh. we you know coming doing postmortems on our events um open ai and and apple okay you're talking about um media deals with open ai ai starting to get some traction um elon musk raising six billion dollars um ai cranking along <laughs> um and dell's earnings are rocking i mean you made a comment um that you know to me it's like a hardware dot-com bubble days if you remember those days in the dot-com dave it was like Sun Microsystem boxes are moving off the shelves faster than they can make them. Hardware and hosting services for internet service providers was booming. Rise of the exodus of the worlds were out there. And then software kind of was a back seat. Now you're seeing software earnings down. Salesforce had earnings out. And so you're seeing kind of a shift to hardware. And Dell but, Dell, but Dell stock got crushed today, down 18%. Did you see that? Did you? I did not see that. Yeah, but did so what happened that? was, if I may, I know you're going to go through the yeah. list, but I'll just do no, a no, quick go, aside. Go, go ahead. So what happened was, is their 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 AI servers boomed, and their they had like unbelievable growth. That was an easy compare with their um, the ISG group, and specifically their servers grew like forty percent plus year on year, but their profit didn't grow. So how could you, how could you grow ser server revenue by that much, but profits? you know, basically stayed the same or were down a little bit. And the reason is because all the money's going to NVIDIA. Right? <laughs> so that's really the case. And so, and storage was flat. So margins were, you know, not up. Uh, they were actually kind of quite, quite tepid. So the combination of huge revenue growth in servers, a beat on the top line, a beat on the EPS, uh, translated into, oh, the beat wasn't good enough and you'd made no money on AI servers. Oh crap, yeah. Dell's not gonna make money on AI servers. Now, the part of the reason is, remember I, 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 I spoke to the, 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 the finance, finance team and they were explaining to me, look, we're doing big deals right now and we're servicing our customers in these big deals and these big deals, we give good margin because we, you know, we wanna service the clients. As we now go into the enterprise with smaller deals, smaller deal sizes, Right now, they're selling to a lot of MSPs. Um, I don't know if CoreWeave is a customer, but that would be an example. You know, like CoreWeave's doing an IPO, but CoreWeave's gonna, gonna be taking big orders, big numbers, Dell gives big discounts on that. When they start selling to enterprises, more onesie twosie, they'll be able to command bigger margins. So, you know, it's surprising to me, given the shortages of GPUs, that they weren't able to, uh, to get better margins but my guess is they're going for footprint. They're going for market share. The, um, you know, Dell, Dell's riding the wave. They're on the hardware side. We talked about this in our last podcast about how that's booming. 
What's interesting is the deal making going on. We kind of speculated about Snowflake and Microsoft alignment when Daddy Bricks was Amazon. I, I made that statement. I, you didn't, so I won't speak for you. Um, the OpenAI Apple deal, they inked a deal, according to the information, um, with um, Apple and OpenAI. So you got Microsoft's got to be wondering about this. So, you know, you got you got OpenAI trying to do a great job, but then you got, okay, Satya Nutella is out there saying, wait a minute, whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa, whoa, what about A little me? reach around action going on. <laughs> so again, remember Anthropic got criticized because everyone's like, you're in bed with AWS, but yet you're doing deals with, you're sleeping with other people. So, you know, it's kind of like they're sleeping around. They have to, they got to hedge. OpenAI has such a great advantage. They have to edge, hedge their bet and they got to get other deals. They can't be bet, betting the ranch just on Microsoft. I'm sure they're not screwing Microsoft over at all, but you know, that's that. The second thing remember is meta. So, you know, Sam Altman, apparently is also cuddling up to meta according to my sources in the valley it's very clear that meta's got a power base of led by zuckerberg and all the young guns and uh, uh, that are his young guns they're 40 now okay they're, they're they've gotten a little older since their their facebook days but if you look at the prime time action there's a big generational shift we've talked about this on the pod before you start to see even the Sam Altman stuff. There was reports on the internet um, news cycles uh, yesterday that Helen Tomer was taken out by a hit piece by Sam Altman. Um, speculation around that, where it's orchestrated, essentially, you know, he got rid of all the foes. Okay, and so he's now back in charge. So the headline uh, with the information is um, <laughs> is is interesting. You know, Sam Altman secures his control as he secures the Apple deal. That's the headline on, on the information. Okay, and. So that is a that is a signal that Sam Altman's power playing was orchestrated, as we kind of know. All right. So what does that mean? He's got the Apple deal. He's got the Microsoft deal. What's he going to do to Microsoft? Leave him at the table? I don't think he will. But according to Business Insider, Satya Nadella is concerned about the OpenAI Apple deal. Uh, a report says again that's Business Insider. We have not confirmed it, but I tell you right now. Um, I would be worried with open AI. Well, you Apple. put in $10 billion, you don't have a board seat, you're basically investing in a company that's run by a holding company, that's run by a holding company, that's run by a nonprofit, um, that's got other outside investor, investors like Vinod Kosla. Uh, you know, I'd be concerned too, especially given the whole, we fire Sam, Everybody threatens to leave. They rehire him. Ilya just left. They, you know, they, <laughs> they just last week instituted this governance AI safety board. Yeah, it's a, it's kind power of power moves. Yeah, power moves. But, but Sam's, you know, Sam's Sam Altman's winning. There's no no question about that. He's consolidating his control. Meanwhile, but, they're tightening their grips on new the new me, the media outlets with Vox Media and Atlantic. They cut a partnership deal where they're going to uh, let yeah. Atlantic and Vox Media train their AI. And so didn't they do a Reddit see, deal? Didn't they do? A, did I, am I mistaken? Didn't they do a Reddit deal too? Um, they did do a Reddit deal. I'm not sure how that's implemented. It's some scuttlebutt that that's a little bit more, more harder to deal with. You know, we have Silicon Angle. We published that, so we didn't know what a, OpenAI is going through. So the question is: Is this good for publishers? Now, the que I always say, I think it's. I personally think it's great for publishers because. The new S, the new search is OpenAI. I use OpenAI more than Google for really good results. Back when Google started, when it was actually a real search engine, okay, not just you know a place where you type in keywords and get paid results. Back in the old days, when Google before they even had advertising, were known for their organic search results. You you would go, you'd get such great discovery, page by page, click click. You'd go drill down, you'd hang out on the site. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a different time. This is 1999, 2000. It was obviously high quality. That is the same experience you're getting with OpenAI right now. You can type in anything. It goes deeper. Give me an example of how this works. And you get it. There's no clicking. It generates for you. At Google, you might not get the result, but if you did, you'd have a couple of clicks to get there. So OpenAI is already going deeper. The context around subject is great. Um, long tail content's phenomenal. So I had a great you know. query on open uh, to, to chat GPT today. I, 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 I wanted to catch up on some of the earnings transcripts and I didn't have time cause I'm doing breaking analysis. So I just, I took the, the Q and a of the, uh, of, of the analyst and asked it to, 
to give me the all the negative sentiment from the analysts, but then and give me the response of management and give me a a, a credibility rating on the response. Right? Chat GPT gave me like this one was a nine, this was a three, this was an eight. It was, it was actually kind of instructive. So I'm doing I'm doing a big thing on Snowflake versus Databricks in preparation for the, this month's events. Yeah, me too. The, the big story is Snowflake. So I got all my notes, and obviously we're tracking the whole open open data model. As you know, it's been our big core thesis. If, if you're listening to this, Dave and I are all over this. Go back to our other pods; you'll hear it and watch our content because we're we're on top of the data stuff. So I type all my notes in about Apache Iceberg. So I did the same query. I'm like, oh, give me two more. I mean, I know what Apache Iceberg. Tell me more. It actually went into great detail to actually give me a concise summary of Apache Iceberg. I mean, I kind of knew it, but I learned a couple new things that weren't obvious that I probably should have known, but maybe forgot. All packaged beautifully in the presentation. The generative AI results are phenomenal compared to Google. Google has that thing at the top. And it's usually from Wikipedia or some lame source. Um, ChatGPT, and then when you check it, it actually works better. The hallucinations are getting better. Anyway, I take my Snowflake data and my Databricks data. I pump it in and said, write me a blog post. So the headline says, Snowflake's strategy with Apache Iceberg, colon, navigating the open data landscape. In the competitive world of data platforms, Snowflake and Databricks are constantly vying for market leadership. Both companies are highly successful, but take markedly different approaches, especially on their strategy on open data. One key area is how Snowflake is handling Apache Iceberg, a high-performance format for massive analytical tables. I'm like, this is great. And then it goes into the specifically laying out that Snowflake has to do this. So then I asked, what would the CEO, the new CEO do? And I put some context in. And it actually said, <laughs> as Snowflake navigates these strategic directions, all eyes are on the new CEO. Will they choose to embrace Iceberg and its open data potential, even if it means disrupting Snowflake's current model? The answer to this question will significantly impact the future landscape of data platforms and determine whether Snowflake can maintain its leadership in the marketplace. So let's double click on that. That's great. They, they, so that is freaking accurate. And it's yep, my well, data that human in a loop fed the AI <laughs> the data. That's the key, like you did. So, and then what, what George and I did today, George Gilbert, and we'll publish tomorrow, is we double clicked on that. So it's Snowflake is at a crossroads right now. And you saw this firsthand when uh, Databricks announced the Unity catalog last June, same week as Snowflake Summit. Remember, Snowflake owns the data, right? All the data has to be inside of Snowflake. And in return, they promise governance and simplicity and very efficient uh, performance on their compute engine. But the data has to be inside of Snowflake. Databricks never owned the data. So what they did with Unity Catalog changed the game. It was brilliant. Is, Uni is, is Unity Catalog the Iceberg REST Catalog? No, so Unity Catalog is the catalog that Databricks announced last June, which is a, a, a governance engine, essentially, for open table formats. So because Databricks never owned the data, they didn't give a shit if they disrupted that. So what they said is, Look at it. We're gonna we're gonna just bring all this value to open data formats, and it's gonna we're gonna have the technical metadata, the operational metadata, all the governance metadata, and we're gonna govern any storage format, irrespective of where it is, because again, it didn't disrupt their business. They they said we're gonna disrupt Snowflake's business. Why is that important? Snowflake two years ago announced support for iceberg tables because you know they saw this coming, and Here's the here's why they're at a crossroads. Everything's got to be inside a snowflake to get that promise of governance. They're leaning in to open table formats like Iceberg, but their conundrum is they can take their IP and they can extend it to Iceberg and say, okay, we're going to bring all of our governance love to open table formats. But if they do that, it opens up. Everybody then can just take the snowflake IP and do whatever they want with it. So... The big question is, how are they going to do that? So they have managed iceberg tables, which are first-class citizens inside of Snowflake. They announced that a while ago. And so, but it's, it, it, it kind of goes against the open. So they're at a, they're, they have a conundrum. If they, if they give their IP to the open table formats, like Databricks just did, they basically, which is what ChatGPT, your blog, was saying, 
they basically disrupt themselves and, and give up their moat. If they bring it inside of Snowflake and make Iceberg Tables a, a managed, you know, first class citizen, then they basically are are kind of quasi open iceberg. So you see the the conundrum there. And yeah. so it's so what's happening, John, is the moat. So let me just say one more thing. Snowflake created the fifth data platform, which is separating compute from storage and basically bringing all the data into Snowflake so that it could be governed and managed and simple. The sixth data platform that we sometimes talk about, the moat is shifting, thanks to what Databricks did, to the catalog. Because and now Gen AI changes the way in which you interact with data. So there's a whole new world coming. And it's going to be really interesting to see if Snowflake can then leapfrog the Databricks moat. And they're going to try to do that with going up the stack to be basically the iPhone of data apps and have the best app data apps on the planet. That's kind of, I think, going to be their 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 next big move. They've announced it. They've signaled it with with Snowpark and Snowpark Container Services. So this is the really interesting dynamic. Sorry, I said last thing. One other thing, John, yeah. is they're basically <laughs> going to war with everybody. They're they're they're, they're going up the Who's stack. Netflix? Yeah, they're going up the stack. We know they're already battling uh, Databricks. We know they've very successfully battled the hyperscalers. Now they're going into the. We, I call it. They're going from the fryer pan, frying pan into the into the fire. They're going into to to uh, Salesforce's domain and Microsoft's domain, who are application vendors. And this is going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. Because remember, uh, Snow, uh, 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 Salesforce announced the data cloud. They kind of stole Snowflake's name. They announced their own data cloud, which is pretty good. And has all the application logic in it and has low code, no code. And then Microsoft, who dominates low code, no code, has, has now a whole suite from uh, the power, all the, all the Azure data services, um, and their whole entire suite now is an integrated platform, a single SKU, something Microsoft's been trying to do for 10 years. So it is just a whole new dynamic for the six data platform. Sorry about the long-winded explanation. But six day, the platform is our research. Correct. And I'm adding that to your little chat GPT summary, which was that human curated, you know, mega blog that you're going to post. I oh, no, it. I had I, I had no system. My notes. Well, yeah, yeah, I had, right. I had, I had raw notes and it's 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 it has new memory. The new version keeps the threads. So they're open tabs now. So it's really good. So now I have a whole snowflake kind of brain developing. It's really interesting. And, you know, I want to come back to that later around what's going on in the valley here. But, you know, one of them is this brain modeling. We're going to go. I want to I want to put a pin in that. I want to come back to okay. it. Uh, did uh, brain modeling because um, it's just quite the rage in out here. But anyway, go back. But real quick, what is that? Just modeling the human brain, like Pat McGovern yeah, and for, at MIT. For AIs and AI could actually replicate the human brain. Yeah, brain like the modeling. MIT Brain Institute, McGovern Brain Institute. But yeah, cool. We'll come back. I, to that. I, I don't really know a lot about it, but it's just been just been the conversation because no one gives me. There's different versions of it. Like, hey, can we replicate a human brain neural network? Blah blah blah. All right. All right. So so getting back to some of the news here. So UiPath had bad earnings. Uh, Salesforce had bad earnings. Mongo UiPath, DB, by the way, sorry. UiPath, by the way, the CEO departed. Rob, Rob Enslin. Enslin. Yeah, which, yeah. So which my understanding, have, according to uh, Daniel Denez on the call, it was of his own doing. He didn't get fired. He basically chose to leave for yeah, personal he reasons. Resigned. He, so. re, he resigned. Our headline yeah. on Silicon Angle is UI stock plummets as CEO Rob Enslin abruptly resigns. Yeah, that is a fact. He was not fired. Guiden, and guidance disappoints. Salesforce uh, shares tumbled after hours on the first earnings miss since 2006. Yep. Salesforce. And then Mongo, too. Mongo tanked on lower guidance. So can I just... Box, can, box beat Target. I'm getting but, boxes. But, but, I mean, but, watching Aaron... Oh, but before you get off of UiPath and, 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 and Mongo... Um, hold, on, hold on, let me finish. Hold on, let me finish real quick because Fox beat targets on earnings, but light guidance. Elastic shares climbed eight percent on strong earnings. Revenue beats in the fourth quarter. Asana impresses investors with better than expected results. So you can see this the trend here. So go ahead, go back to yeah. So it's really it's really mixed. But I, the only point I wanted to make about Mongo and UiPath, there's a clear trend happening, which is they're they're obviously trying to make Gen AI a tailwind. But you, it and I, we know very well all the action, of course, is around GPUs and hardware right now. And there's like that, that circular reference going on between GPUs and hyperscalers and LLMs. 
But so the value of AI hasn't trickled up the stack yet and customers are confused and they're hitting the pause button on platforms like Mongo and UiPath trying to figure out, okay, can we replace these with Gen AI? I don't think they can. I think AI is a lot harder than people realize and it's just going to take some time to gestate up the stack. And, and I think both Mongo and UiPath are, are, are getting hit with that perception. You know, I really feel like there's a vibe in the marketplace, not to be doom and gloomer here, but um, I really think there's a real spending halt. There's a lot of um, uh, uh, excitement around AI and certainly around hardware, but I'm, everyone I talk to, there's layoffs, spending slowing down and cutting. Um, you're starting to see the software players like slow down a little bit, Dave. So I'm feeling like there's uh, there's like a real like weird vibe around what's really happening almost this it's like the, we said this before on the pod that it feels like the tale of two worlds right the hype world and then the under reality of like no, we're good don't look here we're not good kind of thing so it's classic under the iceberg everything looks great but underwater it's like under the water that's the, the different view um i'm not sure are you if you're seeing that but um well, I'll tell you, what I'm seeing. I mean, every every event was just it's booming. We're so, seeing great event action, but I'm just I'm hearing on these meetings things look different. So, I, I tell you what I'm seeing. I, I, you know, I had Crawford Del Pratt, he's the CEO of IDC, on. I have great respect for him. Uh, off camera at the IBM Think, we were talking about um, spending, and I said, "You got spending data. Let's talk about spending data." And then he he shared with me that the IDC spending data says that IT spending is going to grow. I think it's eight percent this year. And Gartner has the same numbers. And I was like, let's not talk about that because I don't think there's any way that's accurate. Our, our spending data with our partner ETR shows, I mean, we're talking three and a half percent growth in IT spending this year. So miles apart. And I, when, and anecdotally, when you talk to customers, that's what they tell you All in the earnings calls, people talking about macro headwinds. I just don't see that. So that's one factor. Second factor is AI. Gen AI specifically is stealing from other budgets. 40% of the customers tell us they're stealing from other budgets. We've been talking about that forever. It's very clearly happening, getting stolen from up the stack software. We're, we're seeing that ServiceNow seems to be the exception. And it's very reminiscent of that circular reference in the dot-com where you had, you just called it, buy Sun servers, buy Unix, buy some Cisco, buy some EMC storage, start a company, advertise, you know, after you raise money, advertise on Yahoo and, and then do it all over again. And then when the VC dries up, the whole thing bursts. And now you've got a lot of funding from, now it's different, it's from hyperscalers, buying GPUs, NVIDIA, you know, wins, startups, you know, all the VCs are now investing in silicon, which they have traditionally been really afraid of silicon. And for a good reason, it's so risky. And so, but to your point, it's very bifurcated right now you've got kind of the haves and the have nots it's interesting to see service now mm -hmm. um kind of winning uh, Mc mcdermott is a is a pretty good magician and and great salesman um i think i think it's more than that he's just inherited a great business and he's not he's smart enough to know which wave to ride he's like gelsinger in the sense he knows waves you know i think service now has always been a great business I mean, yeah you know, I he's taking business. it to another level oh, um yeah. you know what you know what McDermott is, he's the Phil Jackson of <laughs> CEOs, right? He's a great CEO, Phil Jackson, great coach, but part of his strength, his superpower was picking winners. <laughs> like He like, he rigged the system. I, Shaq, Kobe, yeah, I'm in. You know, Michael, I'm in. <laughs> so, and he did some amazing things, don't get me wrong, great coach, but, and he set it up for himself. And I think McDermott picked a good company. Yeah, you know, so I, I like that metaphor. Phil Jackson was legend. Um, so I mean, just the enterprise is going to have a lot of good use cases. And again, I think we talked about this last time. The enterprise will be a lot slower. Um, so that that's one take. The earnings are down. Software Zscaler. Um, you wanted to comment? On oh that? yeah. So on. Zscaler. Again, so another another strong quarter. Love Zscaler. Uh, Jay Chaudhry, visionary. They started the whole sassy. Uh. uh you know, secure access, say edge product, uh, the, the whole category. And so last quarter, they gave a guidance that freaked everybody out because they said, yeah, it's going to be a little bit backloaded to Q4, Q4 ramp, and we're going to, we're kind of reliant on big deals. Well, guess what? That 
was conservatism, conservatism, sorry. And this quarter, they beat, they raised, they, I think, assuaged fears of that, uh, the risk of a Q4 ramp. Uh, they had strong billings, uh, and they got, you, you know, good, they, they've restructured their go-to-market. And everybody was really worried about competition from Palo Alto, uh, from Microsoft, from Fortinet, and some other, you know, non-public companies, which is legitimate because basically Zscaler started the SASE category. Uh, but I think that this really sets up nicely for Zscaler investors that want to get back in. There was an entry point. In fact, the Barclays analyst, Socket uh, Kalia, did a note in February, I think, who basically, he nailed it. He predicted this. He said, I think this is a good entry point for Zscaler, and I think they're going to really have a strong, this sets up for a really strong um, next fiscal year. So I, 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 I like the, the company, and I like what they're doing. I like the management. Real visionaries. So one topic that's coming up in the Valley, and this was not really kind of talked about much, but it was news, okay? Google and Magic Leap partner on augmented reality set remember magic leap no they were they were a company was magic hyped leap. Up. i don't remember the, that magic leap was the first headset i mean the real the first real in my opinion real oh company that was funded to do you know um what um like vision. virtual reality you know the, the goggles remember they, they yeah, they yeah were, i'm looking they, at them now they, yeah, they wow. were hyped up big time um and they're doing a deal with google so Google's getting in the game because they get the, the technology has changed so fast since when they started. Let me go find out when um, um, started. What when they were founded? Yeah, so they they were founded. Oh, I got them at like uh, two thousand eleven. Like yeah, ten years ago, they were early. They had these are cool looking there. goggles. I wish we could yeah, show them. They but... they had a gene. They just had a great technical team. The classic example of too early, right? And so what happened was the software wasn't there, but now with Meta and the goggles and everything going on with Apple Vision Pro, they're bringing the tech back. Google smart. So you know the, this brings up the question: Do you count Google out? Are they are they too big? Is uh, can Sudar help them? Can 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 they actually get the job done? Meta, I think, is a better contender than Google because they're just different company. Um, is Google aged out as a company? Will they compete on the AI front? Not just cloud, Google as a company. Well, compared to Meta, hmm. compared to Amazon. I mean, Google Apple. to me, Google to me is still highly relevant. Um, I, I think about, you know, they got their monopoly in search. I think about Microsoft's monopoly in, in software and, and PC software. And then Microsoft became largely irrelevant before Satya, because they were kind of hanging on to Windows and trying to make, you know, Windows phones and doing really stupid things. Um, but their cash flow was so enormous that they eventually at bottom time and they could figure it out. And then Satya did the whole cloud pivot. Um, I think Google's still relevant, uh, obviously in AI. Um, they're doing some interesting things with, with Waymo. I don't know if that'll, you know, translate into big business, but I, I I don't I don't think they're done yet, um, by any means. And they got so much cash, and they have such a great business. I don't think that's going to go away anytime. I mean, everyone's afraid that Google's going to get disrupted, but I still use Google. You still use Google. I mean, everybody still uses Google. I I use OpenAI more. That's true, but I, they're well, still relevant, in my opinion. <laughs> well, I tell you, the you got the Oculus Rift. Remember. The Palmer Lucky, Lucky bought um, sold his company to Facebook, okay, um, Meta, okay, and so when you start looking at the technology of the Ray Ban, Google Glass kind of vibe, right? The, the it's coming back, smaller, faster, cheaper. So you had Google they, Glass back in the day. I remember your son Alec when he graduated from Palo Alto High School was was <laughs> wearing them. That was like the hip thing to do. He was like the cool kid, right? <laughs> <laughs> Today he get beaten up. <laughs> Privacy issues. I don't yeah, know what right. that was. <laughs> right, he get attacked. He get he get mugged. Take those off. 
<laughs> well, uh, Palmer Lucky called Magic Leap a, a tragic heap of shit, basically, on one article. Uh, but, you know, Magic Leap was ahead of its time. You know, they were good. So Google partnered them with a pretty big deal. I think I think that's a good a good reboot. Uh, again, sign of things to come. You've got brain brain modeling it's being talked about. Um, just overall AI content moderation. Um, you know, AI and mental health is another big thing that's come up too. So you're seeing a lot of um, interest from non deep tech applications, Dave, coming in. So um, interesting points. Uh, I think I think we're so, going to end up. Um, probably looking back and seeing everybody was scared about AI taking over the world like Skynet Terminator, when in reality it probably will have helped more more good things and people than ever before. So, you know, I'm definitely a cheerleader when it comes to AI and open and really strong about getting the guardrails out there, but reining it, reining it with uh, litigation and regulation, no way, not so much. So, so you talk about mental health and AI. And, you know, I, I alluded to a couple of times, my full self-driving, like deep, you know, yeah. you know deep, deep throat knowledge guy. Um, we need to do a whiteboard. I still got to do the whiteboard. We've been on the road the whole time. He told me we met like I don't know, a year ago or so when two years ago, maybe chat GPT came out. He says, do you know what Eliza is? I mean, we probably talked about this before. So Eliza came out in the 60s. It was developed by by Joseph Weizenbaum, and I think it ran on an IBM mainframe. So do Wikipedia Eliza, um, and 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 it was an AI system, you know, that you could talk to. It was like a chatbot. They they called it something different. I forget what they called it. The chat something, and but the point was that they thought it had great potential for people who had depression and mental illness mm -hmm. that they could use the machine to interact. And, you know, machines don't get bored. They don't get tired and, you know, act as a therapist. So anyway, that's kind of interesting that you just brought that up. And I wanted to sort of put that on people's radar, Eliza. Well, there's companies out there checking out some uh, interesting startups out there that are doing stuff for helping people. So that, that's, that's something that's new on my radar. Also, military tech is hot, Dave. So another area that's hot is military technology, the war yeah. uh, in uh, Gaza and uh, uh, Israel's one, obviously the Ukraine war. This is interesting. You know, see military tech. Some, uh, so I think I saw on the all in guys had a stat. I think um, David Sachs talked about how expensive it is to just defend one low cost barrage from Iran into Israel. I think it costs the US a billion dollars just to kind of defend that one strike in Iron Dome. So the technology, you can't sustain that. You can't be spending a million billion dollars a day on that. So lawyers all over this. He was I was talking to David the other day. He's we were prepping for something else and and he's like I've been deep into this military tech. And he, he basically the example he gave was pretty powerful. He said, imagine you got some big US warship mm -hmm. sitting, you know, in this whatever, you know, the Mediterranean. And then all of a sudden you get like a thousand drones that are attacking it from from above and underneath, like submarine drones and airborne drones that are cheap. And there's freaking thousands of them. Like that movie, you know, Bird. Right, birds. I remember the yeah. Hitchcock movie where the birds are attacking everybody. Imagine that, because there's no way that that big warship is going to be able to defend itself. It's done, over. Well, there was, was like, a, there was a movie, um, White House Down sequel, where they had this the um, same thing with the uh, um, the drones attacking the president. Drone strikes, um, little drones. So the question is, these little drones. It's going the technology is getting small, faster, cheaper. It works the same way. Um, and anyway, we got a lot of events coming up, Dave. So I just want to get your take. I want to shift gears a little bit to kind of where we've been. It's been it's event season, so you know we're we're kind of chilling out a little bit here this weekend on R and R, R and R twelve yeah, hour right. day, twelve hour days. You're um, a week jamming <laughs> jamming a week into to four days. But I got to say, it's very impressed with our team. Three concurrent cube gigs at the same time. The cube on location operation is getting almost flawless. I love the perfection of the team, the scale. We did um, Informatica World, Dell Tech World, IBM Think, um, 
just what a great team. The process of the going on the road with the key has just been getting better, and the performance of the capabilities is getting better. So that's been just one observation. Um, but other one was is that IBM Think was different messaging than I thought it would be, and Dell Tech World was kind of what I thought it would be because they were riding high on the success. But different juxtaposition. Cisco lives this week, and I noticed Juniper is going head to head against Cisco. I saw the CMO Gene English on Facebook and LinkedIn challenging, aggressively challenging Cisco. That event's coming up. We got Bob Liberté from our team. We'll participate. We'll be there. Now, Zias has got a preview on Silicon Angle right now. You've got Snowflake uh, Data Cloud Summit. You're going to be at San Francisco. I'm going to be at Click Connect in Orlando and Avis Financial Services event in New York. Uh, and so I'm going to be in Orlando and New York next week. You're going to be in San Francisco. So we got, uh, and folks in, in, in Las Vegas, we got the cube at Cisco live snowflake click connect. And then the week after is the data bricks event in San Francisco. It's definitely so, data, data week, data weeks. Data week, but you'll so, like that click show. That click show is good. Um, click, I'm really looking forward to click connect because you know, that company you got to watch these guys, okay? Their innovation is pretty strong. You look at what they're doing. They have huge customer traction, right? And then it, it, there's two types of events. There's the look at us event, and then there's the look at us and our innovation and the customers backing it up. I noticed that Click over amplifies by design their customers. So, you know, they got a great team. And like I said, looking pretty good. I can't wait. Can't wait for that. Only one day, then we're going to pop up to uh, to New York. Click has a really um, forward thinking head of comm, CMO, whatever you want to call it, Miranda Foster, um, and she puts on a good show. Brings in good talent. Um, yeah, I think you'll. I think you'll enjoy that show. He yeah, was talking to my friend Brian O'Shaughnessy, who came by my place yesterday. You know, Brian. Uh, for, he's a comms professional. Um, he's him and his, uh, group friend group, they've all done comms, at all the top companies, Sean Garrett, um, runs mix panel, mix, not mix panel, mixing board, which is a collective of PR professionals. Um, um, Larry, you used to be a, over at Facebook and then, um, Google before that with Brian, all the luminaries, they're all senior people. They're all coming to the same conclusion. Comms professionals are realizing that the organic consumption of this new media world we're moving into, this next generation social media, I should say, social media 2.0, whatever you want to call it, the communication professionals are more important in some cases, if not all the time, than the CMO, because the comm professionals understand context. And so, you know, there'll be always be a day for the big advertising campaigns on TV, but a lot of actions happening in the multiple channels with organic content. Re AI is going to create reuse, just the stuff that we have. So what's what what they're all agreeing to is actually you can actually put a communication strategy around content with talent and speak spokespeople with video. So the who the people who handle spokespeople isn't the CMO and marketing team. It's the comms team. It's the PR and AR teams. So what you're seeing is the power is going to be in the data, and the data is inside the heads of the people who talk on camera. That's the new secret sauce. So what's happening in the inner circle of these in comms team is, is that the smart the smart talents identifying it and moving right to the top of the company because you shoot long form videos and, and then merchandise it with like what tools we have. It's a secret, secret formula. And what happens is the impact is now manageable and, and marketable and measurable. Meaning you could do it, you see the results and you can put numbers to it. Meaning sales. That Putting people together in certain configurations inside communities and inside video in these watering holes and these channels creates results. And at the end of the day, that's a comms team. So this is a big nuance point right now we're seeing in the industry. And that's why media is failing and a lot of other things are kind of failing because the roles of who's delivering the value are changing. And you pointed out with the click example. So this is actually something that's happening right now, and it's happening very fast. We saw this early with the cube, but it's happening now everywhere. Everyone's got a video camera, but what do you do with the video? This is a big changeover. Again, back cool. to back to seeing the future. Old way, new way. Comms is the new CMO. 
head of corporate communications, head of corporate comms, has PR, AR, influence relations, investor relations, all that stuff. That's now marketing. No CMO level. Well, and and the, the use cases for video, to your point, I mean, there's so many. Um, I can't tell you how many salespeople come up to me and say, I love the cube. I love watching it. Really? Why? What, 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 what does it do for you? And they're like, Oh, I get my messaging down. I get to learn about what the competition is saying. <laughs> I, I get to listen to what customers are doing. And yeah, I mean, yeah, video, we bet on video early on, John. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what video do you see, first what AI you, what enabled. Do you, what do you, you think? What do you think about Cisco Juniper batting? Cause now Juniper is part of HPE taking the gloves well, off. Well, they've been going back and forth. You know, I, I can't say this for sure, but I feel like Chuck Robbins started it when he said people want more than just a dashboard for AI. They want security. And he, of course, he's talking about, you know, HPE and Juniper. And, um, and so I, I'm not surprised that Juniper's you know, responding back like, cause they have obviously a lot more than dashboards. They've done some pretty cool work according to La Liberté. And I, I actually think that Juniper, that, that, Juniper's AI was a, a a decent part of the evaluation that they got from HPE, and I love the move that HPE's making. You know, networking's where all the action is now. Yeah, it's, networking right? is hot. I'm telling you, HPE with that move for Juniper is a good call. I think the two CEOs get along. We'll see how long they they work together. Hopefully, they can keep that partnership going. But you know, it, networking is driving all the the data transport. Everything's behind networking now. Data availability, the governance, the privacy behind it, the security. Um, and when you start getting into centralized versus decentralization, networking will be a big part of it. Late, network latency, where's the data inside the application? Uh, LLMs and foundation models need data in real time. So I think a whole nother system level is going to change. That's why I love the Snowflake coverage we're doing with Databricks as well. We're on top of the data modeling, the data layer, the semantic layer, and what changes going on there, as well as the infrastructure down to the chip level. And, and you know, you're seeing the chip stuff happen all the time. AMD, uh, ARM announced some big news this week. Did you see the ARM uh, uh, stuff? Uh, more news around ARM. They they unveiled their uh, 2024 CPU core designs. Yep. Okay. Yep. And, more power and efficient. Um, just more, <laughs> more power efficiency. And, and NVIDIA is going to be partnering with, with ARM more deeply. They've been an ARM for a while, but for, you know, going after the PC and edge opportunities, you know, yeah. edge is going to be huge. Um, well, let's well, talk about, let's, let's talk about this because this, this ties to your breaking analysis last week. And I think, um, yeah. it's really deep. If you're listening to this, go check out breaking analysis by Dave Vellante, uh, on so the cube research and also on siliconangle.com too. Uh, the title is called how NVIDIA TSMC Broadcom Qualcomm will lead a trillion dollar Silicon boom. Okay. I stole the, your trillion dollar headline from Andy <laughs> Jassy. It's trillion dollar baby. <laughs> I think trillion. Really, that was be, epic. It gets people's attention. Yeah, but <laughs> but you bring a question about Nvidia, but the, really the conversation around is silicon. Okay, obviously love Silicon Angle as the site that it hosted on because it's the angle of silicon. But but seriously, this is a big piece because it's a lot, of, lot to unpack here. Arms involved, Intel's involved. What's an accelerator? What's a bolt on? What's the packaging of chips? So there's a is an innovation in, in chips itself to get more horsepower for AI, but also packaging. And then you got Qualcomm, you got ARM, you got Intel, TSMC, all these different players. How, how do people figure out what's the difference? Because we talked last time that ARM is going to have massive position in the market. And if you look at you know, where it was a decade ago, completely different animal. Take yeah. us through the ARM. AMD's got something coming up too. I heard there's AMD announcement coming up. I think it was... Might have been Napoleon Hill or might have been Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. I can't remember. I think it was Napoleon it Hill. Ba basically said a, a, a small lever can move a big stone. And that's ARM. So ARM doesn't have a lot of revenues. In fact, they didn't even make our top, you know, whatever it was, 12, you know, revenue contributors to the silicon business. They were in the other category. So their revenues are not, you know, that enormous. But their impact on the industry has been phenomenal. I mean, they and TSMC with the outsource fab and the, the, the splitting the design from the fabrication have changed the industry. 
And you called this last week that Intel's decision not to go for the iPhone silicon opened the world for ARM was right there saying, hey, we'll help. And so ARM wafer volumes have exploded. Volume is everything in semiconductor manufacturing because to take advantage of the next node and take advantage of Moore's law, and now that's morphing into, you know, called Jensen's law. I don't know if this, that's that's kind of a thing I made up, but his, his law is spend, spend more, you'll save more. But, <laughs> but the curves are accelerating in terms of performance improvements. The key is as you move from, you know, the current node, the process node to the next one in silicon manufacturing, you, you have to have volume in order to get cost advantage because the next, the next node, when you start is always more expensive, but until you ramp up and get high yields and get to volume. And so, so volume is everything in silicon manufacturing and, and competitiveness. And guess who has the volume arm? They've got all the volume. It's, the volume game is over for x86. x86 will be a fine managed decline business, but that's been over for a while. And and ARM risk five is going to have massive volumes at the edge. And that's where the economics are going to be driven in silicon. And ARM just completely changed the game. Yeah. I mean, and that's going to continue to put pressure on the other competitors to have product. That's all going to drive more AI more AI action. And like, if you look at the um, other news we mentioned earlier, Elon Musk X AI raises $6 billion. It's $6 billion. Core weave. Jump uh, change. Core, core <laughs> weave. He paid $56 billion for Twitter. I still can't believe that. Uh, core weave plots a 2025 IPO. Okay, interesting. I That's wonder, interesting. And what was going to be NYSE or NASDAQ. So and they I, need they need cash and they, they got to go to public markets to get it, yeah. right? Well, Is asked. that a signal that 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 they can't raise the money in in, in, I know. in it, private. I think it's well, markets. I think, I think the signal is actually good because they're going to be open up their books going public. Is can't wait to see those books. I can say, <laughs> how much capex is in there? I mean, they got to be doing good to go public. I mean, how much can you raise in the public markets? And they can't raise privately. I mean, if Elon's raising six billion, I mean, the private market's just as robust as public. From a fundraising standpoint, I'm not sure I see that as a as an issue. I think they, maybe they, for they, Elon, but I don't know. Is Core I mean, Weave Core Weave's pretty like, freaking hot company right now? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, but, but but would you go public right now? I mean, depends. If the numbers were good or not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I would mean, you? Uh, I mean, basically, you know, this the market's still yeah, pretty tepid for IPOs. You know, I I gotta say, maybe I shouldn't say this because it might eliminate my access to parties for the next two years and, and fun <laughs> events, but I don't think companies should go public. Like, like maybe like I, if you really got good fundamentals, go public, but I don't think you have to anymore. Look at how long Databricks has stayed private. Look how long Stripe has stayed private. There's enough um, experience now in the market where you can have mechanisms with the banking community to have kind of a liquidity. I wrote about this on my old blog before I started Silicon Angle. Secondary purchasing is now standard. So basically liquidity is built into the private market, except there's no market. There's no buyers and sellers. So this, the, the price valuation is not managed through how free markets operate, Dave. People pay and bid and ask, right? Like that's how the stock market works. But see, there's not enough volume on the private side. So if you can get the liquidity, like a Databricks and a Stripe, they're constantly raising more money. So if... Funding is a money make. If IPOs is a is a money raising exercise, which it used to be in the Valley, the Silicon Valley world of venture capital, you go public and you get liquid, and then you have holding periods for VCs and management. That was also a fundraising event because you sold stock. Well, if you don't need to go public to go fundraising, why would you create all the mechanisms like Sarbanes Oxley, all this compliance? You got to go public. You have, 30 day shot clock earnings, you know, earnings shot clocks, a lot of different behaviors. So to me, stay private as long as you can and then go out when you have numbers. Because what's the benefit? Yeah, maybe there's some equity financing or different financing vehicles. But that's just if you're not working out. If you got like good traction, you could raise on the privates unless the private dries up. So I, I just think that it's a little bit counterintuitive, but I would stay private as long as you can. 
Well, know? I mean, there are some benefits to being public, despite the pain in the ass that it is and, and the compliance stuff. I mean, you know, being able to, I mean, there's definitely a marketing advantage, being able to potentially use your stock as, um, as, as acquisition currency. Although a lot of deals are all cash these days or were certainly during ZERP, um, maybe less so now, and maybe that's less attractive, but that could come back. It just does, it does give you some flexibility in terms of raising debt. Um, but, mm -hmm. but I, I don't know, unless to your point, <laughs> unless you got the numbers right and the market conditions are right it's pretty frothy right now but not sure that's going to hold we'll see elections are sort of iffy um but i think it's i think right now if i if i were a company i probably wouldn't go I'd probably wait for databricks to open up the floodgates but you remember how long it took cloud air to go public john now i wouldn't necessarily that was a, say that was a mistake because i didn't have the numbers but they were private for a long, long time, maybe too long. Yeah. And then the market passed them by. Yeah. Um, well, also they had a big investment from Intel. Remember they had to deliver that value to them. Yeah. At some point, you know what? too much money, you know, that, that you know what though? Problem. People often complain about the, the, the 90 day shot clock and how oh, U S companies aren't forward thinking, but you know, in a lot of ways, the public markets and the pressure to perform I know there are some downsides if you're doing going through a transformation and you know going private like Dell did, you know, works. But generally speaking, the pressure that it puts on you has created exceptional US companies. <laughs> and so I'm not sure it's such a bad thing, all that short-term thinking, as long as you have visionary management that can think long term as well and basically tell the markets to, you know, piss off when they have to make those investments, like Dell's doing now. Dell's saying, Hey, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to invest in the future. We're going to invest in the, in the customer base. Um, and you know, we're going to take a hit. Snowflake's doing the same thing yeah. now. Snowflake's took a hit last quarter because it's spending money on CapEx. You know, that if you're making bets, well, and, we'll see, we'll see how it's going down just to kind of, kind of close out here events for next for the cube. Check us out. We're going to be at Snowflake summit. I mentioned that earlier. Dave's going to be there. I'll be at Click in Orlando and then ADO's Financial Services event in New York City, FinTech. And then back up at Databricks. Databricks, we have the cube on the floor. So if you if you are going to Databricks, you're awesome. listening to this, ping me. I'll be there. We have call for pay speakers. we got a couple of editorial openings uh, as well as some sponsorship opportunities, but mainly you know, good. We got a great guest lineup for that. I think Dave, you got some spots available at Snowflake for some uh, analysts. I do. I have, I, I have editorial spots on Monday. Um, I'm going to be in and out of the analyst program. I, I, Monday. They told me they, I could, I could attend, but they don't have a chair for me this Monday, Thursday. What do you mean? They don't have this, a chair for you. What? This Monday they said they don't have a chair. I'm like, but, I swear to God, John, my, I have, I, if you measure the production of depth in-depth research on Snowflake, I would say I'm the number one snowflake analyst. I'm not saying I'm the most knowledgeable about the company, but but with the, with the body of work that that we've created whoa, whoa, hold on. over the they last don't, they four don't have years, a, they don't have a seat for you or a chair. No, no chair, no like, seat. They get, you, you're welcome to attend, but you can see, you have to stand. It's like 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 no on. physical chair. Yeah, but that's okay. I mean, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, you know why? Because Snowflake thinks of me as Cube, and they put me in a PR bucket. I have a great relationship with the PR people. The 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 Frank AR Slootman people. Said on the, Frank Slootman said on the cube that you know their messaging better than their own people. That was at service now, but, but uh, he did oh, reference okay. my work. He did reference my work in front of the Wall Street uh, uh, financial analyst a couple of years ago. So I don't know if you read Dave Vellante stuff, but he yeah. referenced it. But but then I think the AR people at Snowflake. Oh oh yeah yeah he's an analyst, but they, they they're nice to me and they you know they invite me to stuff, but they you know kind of forget about me. But so. Oh, great. Okay. Why don't we just showcase our analyst chops right now on talk about their high iceberg? I have, I'm doing a really deep dive well, we on this talk, right now. We just talked well, about that, right? I, I mean, could, I could, we can go wait deeper tomorrow. Talk, we, we can go dropped. deeper and talk a lot about that. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> Databricks is so, winning. Are they I winning? Know. I guess I was, you know, little, well, well, actually we'll, we'll publish oh, some data to, tomorrow. I'll tell you. So no, the all, okay, all kidding aside, Snowflake loves you. Do they get back to you all the time? So yeah, so no, they're great. Was it an issue of that? They didn't have a pass for you? No, they'll let me in. It's just on me. You know, I don't, I don't market myself aggressively as an analyst. I just put out my work and hope that that speaks for itself. But you know, in this day and, and age, you're a real analyst. 
But in this day and age of promotion and influencer and, you know, I don't know uh, how they, you know, make these decisions, but, and they got, they have great analysts. They got Sanjeev Mohan. They got guys like Tony bear. George is in the program. I just, you know, it was just a, just a miss, I guess on my part, but I was kind of butthurt. And I, so, uh, so one of the analysts sent me the agenda for Monday and, and I'm like, Oh, you're not, you're not even in the I, program. That's why. No, I'm not in the program, but I'll crash it. They'll let me crash it. They're cool like that. They, they're friends. Um, but I just feel like I'm, I'm, I don't like to have to like beg to get into the analyst program. It's sometimes, kind of the, the, sometimes the people on the AR side are sleep at the switch and they don't get what a real analyst does. They think that they want to get the selfie crowd in there and get selfies. So Dave, you got to up your selfie game. Dude. I do. Come I have on, to up like, my selfie game. Come on. I can look at, taking look at. selfies with Sridhar. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I but find my funny? body of work, I got to tell you, my body of work on Snowflake has been, I over the last dude, three or four years, has been pretty good. Dude, I, I, no other. I put it up against anybody. No honestly. other. Honestly, you're the number one. You, I'll just say it. You're Thank the you, number John. one Thank analyst you. on Snowflake, and I can, <laughs> I would de defend that in front of anyone in the industry. Anybody. It's measured anybody. by production and depth of research. I would put yeah. put well, my just, work up against anybody. I, there are breath, people who are more breath, technical than breath, I am, and breath and depth. Yep. The, so, the, gam, the full package. So, and what's, what's even better is I know for a fact that you're impacting wall street numbers because I know the financial analysts are calling you based on your work. It's true. It's <laughs> so, true. So, However, uh, I will say this. Maybe, say this. Okay, maybe Gartner has a little bit more influence uh, no, no, than so, you. So let me say this though. Let me say this. So part of the reason why I, I, I'm a pretty humble person generally, but part of the reason why I think my coverage is so effective is because we have a great cube collective people like sanjeev mohan doug henshin uh you know he's not in the cube collective but tony bear obviously george gilbert is like my sidekick and all this stuff rob stretch is really strong in it so i collaborate extensively with people who have more depth of technical knowledge than i do you know but my power is just extracting that and you know curating it and maybe connecting dots in some other areas and Personally, I think we've done a really good job of that. And so I, I, I need to do a better job of marketing that. So I get recognized by the AR people so that I get invited to, you know, the cocktail party. I know I got a perfect person to bring on board to help, um, wake up the AR programs, the, the reality of what's happening. Um, Hey, quick, quick side news here. Not that to change topics from your awesomeness as an analyst and as well as mine as, as a, <laughs> that's as a, embarrassing influence. i'm sorry we can um, go there so so um out in the bay area which i've been here for 24 years um is uh a beer called anchorstein sure anchorstein very great beer great beer it's got a reddish closed. tinge to it doesn't it it, 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 it abruptly closed last july and everyone's like oh, what? No. you know it's a it's an icon because you know how things close it's a whole nother the Shit's going crazy in San Francisco. So a bunch of people I know, including friends I know, like Mike Walsh, on, who, who's a friend on Facebook, and I met a few times, the um, successful entrepreneur and now VC, was been getting action. So apparently a billionaire, the guy who's the Turkish-born CEO, founder of Chobani, the largest Greek yogurt manufacturer, purchased the brewery and the home in Petrero Hill in San Francisco. So Anchor Steam is wow. back. Anchor Steam, San Francisco Brewing Company is back after 127 year history. That's that's awesome. I awesome. like Anchor Steam. Finally, that's a, that's a, a great beer. story out of San Francisco that's positive. The community get together. Um, it's just, it's just a, a bunch it's a of lot cool of people. negatives in San Francisco. Of, there are I some saw... cool people here, and <laughs> you know. <laughs> Mike Walsh, story. John Jensen. I mean, look at this is very cool people. And um, just wanted to give a shout out to Mike Walsh and uh, and the team there. Um, you, know, you know, I love beer, but, you know, this is just one of those icons that represents the city. So, um, hey, you know, it's like the Red Sox. You love to love Fenway. Don't change the historic nature. Well, all right, Dave, that's all I got. I mean, I'm, I'm gearing up for next week. It's going to be. Um, you know, Snowflake Databricks this month. Big story. HP yeah, Discover, funny. You're, Cisco you're the, Live, Juniper. You're in the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast again, like last week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got, freaking a freaking we flyer miles. That. My kids are gonna love all the free miles they're gonna get. They always ask me for the frequent flyer miles, but this is I'm happy to give it up. But look at this has got some this some historic things happening in this industry right now. And I'm telling you, we are at the nexus of it right now. The cube 
is that the nexus of 14 years doing the cube. I got to say, I'm more excited now than ever before. The team is amazing here in the cube and the new team is coming on board the collective, the community is stepping up. And I think you're going to see a whole nother AI surge of content creation. And we're, I mean, I'm just, it's going to be great Dave. And more importantly, the commentary opportunities from the platform shift that's happening, their platform shift is happening. The entrepreneurship activity is going to be a, a Renaissance Cambrian explosion. It will be awesome. So have a great well, awesome, weekend. Awesome. Awesome. Having this chat with you, John. Thank you. Uh, have a great weekend. And, uh, yeah. you know, we should get a sponsor for this show. We don't have, I was about to say brought to you by the cube. Dave Gra- cube and Silicon great. angle. The have cube a great, research. have a great weekend and, uh, get all your summer plans taken care of. I'll see you <laughs> next week. See you, John.